Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader. Thanks so much for joining us. Brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Lydia Kang, author, along with Nate Peterson, and he also co-authored Quackery with Lydia, which is a good read now, given our last president's absurd and idiotic manner of attacking COVID. Um, but she's the author of Patient Zero, which we'll be talking about today, which is subtitled A Curious History of the World's Worst Diseases, uh, published by Workman. It'll be released on November 16th. Lydia is a Renaissance woman of sorts. She's the author of young adult fiction, adult fiction, uh, nonfiction, and poetry. And she's also a practicing physician whose poetry and nonfiction have been uh, published in JAMA, many other periodicals. And look, her books are so varied. 40 Years of the Empire Strikes Back, <laughs> Opium and Absinthe, The Impossible Girl, A Beautiful Poison, Catalyst, and Among the Shadows. Um, it's like she's four different authors while she's practicing med medicine. Meanwhile, I got up at 10 o'clock today. So, <laughs> so given our times, Patient Zero may actually be the most important book she's ever written. It's divided into three sections, infection, spread, containment, each of which is, seems somewhat self-explanatory. In the first, we'll look at things like ergot, Ebola, the plague, mad cow disease. And the second part shows us uh, HIV, typhus, measles, leprosy, syphilis, typhoid fever, and then containment, which is, I guess, most important to us as a race. We'll learn about vaccines for polio and hepatitis, cholera, rabies, maybe, and smallpox. A wonderful aspect of the book, which we can't really explore today. I wish I was technologically advanced enough to share this screen with a PowerPoint showing the photos, illustrations, and the chart that increase our understanding and knowledge uh, the theme of the book, the nature of disease, and the men and women who have combated it. So another reason to buy the book. Uh, in all, Patient Zero informs, teaches, and yeah, entertains us as we follow a history that is integrally and inextricably tied to our natural history and the history of nations, politics, and the very nature of humanity. So welcome, Lydia, and thanks for talking to us today. Thank you so much for having me. And I apologize if the dogs bark once in a while. I, um, life is a little chaotic sometimes. And <laughs> so, but thank you so much for having me. And I'm really excited to talk about this book. It's been a long coming and a lot of work went into this. And uh, it is um, far more timely than I wish it was, unfortunately. I agree. But I also have a dog next to me. So perhaps they could conduct the interview. <laughs> do your things <laughs> if they um, had their way it would be more chaotic but um but uh, they do show up in the book here and there the dogs so uh not my dogs in particular but dogs in general so um but uh yeah it's the the writing of the book I had a lot of companions writing it um Nate and I you know have been working on this for a couple of years now and it just so happened that when we were really coming to um, a decision about writing it, the pandemic hadn't really started yet. It is, there was like a little inkling of maybe there was something brewing in, in China and we thought, oh, maybe it'll make it into the book, maybe not, who knows. And so it's just very strange to be on this side of um, having written the book during a pandemic and, and now having it in the book, it's just, it's a little, it's unfortunately surreal. Yeah, also I got a new understanding of hair of the dog um, anyway, <laughs> in the book, which I had no idea about. It's funny, I searched the, the title, when I was looking, researching, I searched the title Patient Zero in Amazon, and there's 19 books with that title. So what is so intriguing to us about this idea of going back to a point where we find out where and how and who started something? So I think it's, I, I think it's in our human nature to want to know the origins of things or the reasons for things. Um, we're a very curious species. We like to investigate um, why things happen. I mean, I can't imagine I'm the only person who's ever gone down the Wikipedia hole to 
look up one thing and then find out seven you know pages later that now they're reading about the origins of brandy or who knows what but it's we're very curious people and we we want to know um you know what um why we get sick where it comes from um and we call we all care very deeply about our own bodies and what happens to them and so i think that from that comes this very natural instinct to want to know um, you know, why things like the COVID pandemic has happened. But, you know, even, um, you know, from a more academic point of view, scientists and physicians and pathologists, we want to know what origins are too, for the sake of understanding them better so we can help people, so we can prevent things, so we can cure things. So, you know, it's a, it's a, um, it's a both an academic and I think a personal kind of endeavor that we do when we're looking for origins. You know, it's funny in your, your about section on your web, it says you like to knock wood. And I have a four by eight desk made of oak. And I haven't been <laughs> doing that well lately. So when I read your book, Being Me, periodically, I thought I might have one of the diseases. <laughs> morning, I knocked on the table. You so know, it's a lot like, um, I think that people reading through this book are going to go through what most medical students go through when we're in medical school because we start learning about all these diseases right and then it invariably every single medical student reads something and they're like oh my god I have that <laughs> and like I'm pretty sure I have this disease and they worry and they fret and you know sometimes it actually comes to fruition sometimes it's not actually there but yeah you'll probably read through this and like you know you'll have a sniffle or a cough and you'll be reading about you know the plague and pneumonic plague and you'll be like oh my god my God, I have the plague. Um, but most likely you don't. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I don't, you know, that's what a doctor says. Most likely, probably everything's okay. <laughs> yes. Like, yeah. I, There's a reason why we do that because we don't like to speak in absolutes. We don't like to say there is a hundred percent chance that this is going to absolutely make you feel better because nothing is always that predictable. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why, you know, looking at all these diseases and living with them it's really difficult because people want a really solid answer about things. What's the origin? How can I definitively cure this? What can we do to make sure this never happens again? And um, who is the patient zero, right? So all of these things, we demand a very clear cut answer. We can't always get them. And it's, it's hard. As physicians, it's also hard. We would love to give more clear cut answers, but sometimes it's so nuanced. Yeah. And the book is peppered with humor, like just like that. You talk about um, the rare disease that can cause this the disease that can cause this rare type of skin cancer. And then you go, don't, don't get all excited. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you do it right there. Okay. Yeah. I, I tend to jump around, but is that okay if I jump around? Cause it's really hard. Yeah. To I think jumping around is fun because there's a lot of stuff in here and, and um, it's, I, I jump around too. And honestly, that's where a lot of my ideas come from. So that, that yeah, happens. <laughs> but I will start at the beginning of the beginning. Cause in your introduction, you talk about Gail and, I was talking to another doctor about him too and about the four humors and all that stuff mm -hmm. but it still was kind of he's kind of a doctor zero you know yeah, yeah. Talk a little he bit was about, i mean you know yeah. he was when his stuff came when he started to really um uh, espouse the humoral theory of medicine it had been around for some time but he really um made it even more popular and more sort of commonplace than before and it pervaded um, our understanding of how the human body worked for centuries. And so how we th did things with Galen, um, you know, as far as the humoral theory, this is how the body works. When one of the humors is off, this is why you get sick, you know? Um, and people don't really think of phlegm, bile, and blood as things that are why you are the person that you are, your personality, why you're sick or why you're healthy, um, because it's been completely debunked for well over a hundred years, like 200 years now, and we just haven't gone through, through, we haven't been abiding by the humoral theory at all. But, um, but it was such a big, big thing. And it, it lent a lot of um, weight to how we looked at a lot of these diseases, these historical diseases throughout time. And we really screwed it up as far as treatment and where they came from because we didn't know any better yeah, it's funny you know it's re really not jumping around because everything is interconnected so i could mm -hmm. start any place in your book and just go back and forth and, and, and that reminded me of one of the diseases i thought a lot about in the book was cancer because it's kind of different in my mind and and then i had no idea that paul ehrlich 
started chemotherapy. So talk, do that little story. So the idea of, of chemotherapy, like we tend to think of chemotherapy as um, a medicine that you take, maybe a pill or an IV treatment that helps to cure um, or helps to treat cancer, um, a chemical that is a therapy. But um, Paul Ehrlich was really looking in terms of um, a medicine that would be the so-called silver bullet, like the, the one thing that could uniquely um, kill a, a bacteria to disable it so that it could um, actually cure something. And so that's where his concept of, and he, he coined the term, you know, chemotherapy or something that was so specifically created to, to kill something. Um, so it's kind of interesting that the source is actually from um, something in infectious diseases and not in cancer therapy. Right. And he actually coined the term mag magic bullet, right? Yeah, he did. It's not from vampire stories, <laughs> stuff like that. I know. I know. That's exactly what I was thinking when I read it. And then that's the kind of thing you find out and you go, well, I, well, I'll, I'll give you another example that, that uh, people kind of confused them and scared them. And real quick, when I adopted Samantha and Annie from China, I went at the height of the SARS epidemic, the oh epidemic to Guangzhou. Wow. And I went there, my, my ex-wife packed like 5,000 masks. When I got there, not one person was wearing a mask oh and gosh. everything was fine. But it's funny that people don't understand that COVID-19 is, is SARS. Yeah, it's a, it, the, the technical name is SARS-CoV-2. So they are related um, viruses um, they, you know, they're from the same, that's the same family. Um, but, and when, when the first, um, when SARS-CoV-2 started to show up in China, um, the original physicians who were starting to see it in the hospitals questioned like, is this SARS again? Um, like the original SARS, the first SARS, um, but it turned out to be a different, different version. So I, I yeah, I think, I think we've kind of forgotten when, when COVID was first coined, like the name of it, um, we were, it was originally being called SARS-CoV-2. And I think a lot of people forget that there is a relationship with um, the, the other SARS virus and that, you know, coronaviruses are not a new thing and they've been around some time and, and they've wreaked havoc before. So look how we go through the book. It's funny because that leads me to zoonosis and the idea, whether it's a gondolin bat, gondolin, gondolin lizard or a bat or whatever, so there's this zoonosis, which is uh, Ebola, rabies, bird flu. Are you talking mm -hmm. about all of them? Uh, yeah, there, there are so many. I mean, um, oh my gosh, let me see if I can find the list. I mean, tapeworms, rabies, SARS, Ebola, anthrax. So there are a lot of um, infections out there, parasites, viruses, bacteria um, that originally came from animals. And they were living in animals. And at some point in time, they sort of jumped over and infected us. And sometimes they jump over and infect us. And then we infect each other. And it's sort of, you know, we keep infecting each other and it's an around and it's around thing. So like the influenza virus is probably the most commonly known one, right? So the flu that we get a flu shot for every year is a zoonosis. Um, it comes from, you know, sometimes it comes from a pork um, source parts of the virus. Sometimes parts of the virus come from avian or bird sources. They sometimes do a little dance and do switches and things like that, but they are not, they, they came from animals, jumped over to us. And unfortunately, they're very good at transmitting from person to person. And so we sustain those infections, but sometimes the infections are um, enzoonic. So they're like, they just, they infect a person and that person can't give it to somebody else. So rabies is like a classic um, a type of infection where you, you get scratched by a rabid bat or you get bitten by a rabid dog and you get rabies, but you can't really give it to anybody else. It's really hard to, I mean, I suppose if you bit another person, <laughs> you could give it to someone else, but it's not like the flu where it will just self-sustain itself by transmitting to other people. Lyme disease is yet another one of those things that it's once it's in a person, the person can't give it to other people. It needs this like sort of original contact point. Um, from an animal or from a vector, like a tick or a flea or something like that. But yeah, uh, the, like, uh, the vast majority of infections today are zoonotic. They are originally from animals. And that kind of blows my mind. I think that would 
sort of blow anybody's mind because we tend to think of these infections as sort of out there and then sometimes they're in us, but there's such a relationship between humans and our environment and animal sources that we are less aware of, I think, um, for the most part. And I think that also speaks to how much we forget how much we actually um, change our environment and we have manipulated our environment so that these back and forth infections actually can happen. You know, when you were talking about that, I was thinking of Lyme disease as another one. And you know, I live just out, outside of Philadelphia and there's a lot of hunters here and um, outdoorsmen. And I know so many people that have gotten Lyme disease. And so it's luckily that now they are aware of it. It's good now that a lot of people are aware of it because the sooner you get the antibiotics, the more likely you won't have mm -hmm. some of these long, you know, people think of Lyme disease where you get it as you're over with it. But as you say, uh, some of the effects last for maybe the rest of your lifetime. And the other thing was, I thought it was Lyme, Connecticut. And then you introduced a gentleman to me that I had no idea. I don't know who Otzi the Iceman is. <laughs> Oh, see the Iceman. All right, you guys all have to Wikipedia this one because there's some really interesting pictures of him because he's extremely well-preserved. He's like an Iceman from, oh, I'm forgetting exactly how long ago, a very, very long time ago. He's an Iceman and he was preserved really well. And when they did some DNA analysis, they did find um, Lyme in him. So it's been around a long time. I think it was sort of simmering in the North American content, continent and just sort of ready to come out at the right time. And that's, and it really just sort of kind of exploded um, in the last couple of decades. Yeah, you guys are tenacious. Checking to see whether the DNA of a ice man. From yeah, well, you know, it's funny because when we wrote the book, we were like, okay, we're gonna have all these patients, zero stories. We wanna find out these, these interesting stories where like the origin is maybe a single human being or at least what we think is a single human being, like, you know, we're gonna finger point at this person and then we're gonna actually tear it apart and tease it apart and figure out, well, what's the actual truth here? Is this person actually the one who's responsible for infecting all these people? But more often than not, what the story really reveals is no, it's not really that simple. Pointing a finger at a single person isn't um, usually how it goes. We get it wrong a lot and that a lot of the origins of these are really complicated and they, they um, predate the idea of where we think things came from. Yeah, it's funny because before you read your book, most Americans just know about typhoid Mary and they mm -hmm. know maybe about, I guess it's that flight attendant with regard to AIDS, mm -hmm. as, as possible patient zero. And I guess he actually is named, I think. But, he is, um, he is. And actually that was probably one of the most complicated difficult chapters for me to write on HIV. And um, it was, I actually was in New York um, doing medical school and residency in the early 1990s. So, you know, in the 1980s was when the HIV and the AIDS crisis really sort of boomed. And so uh, in the early 90s, we had just started getting some good medications for HIV, but it was still considered a death sentence. And I was working on the virology wards at Bellevue Hospital in New York. And so I was sort of, I remember when it was still um, this really, really frightening, frightening scenario. And so to have to do the research to find out where did it actually start was really for me a personal kind of journey to find out, you know, this I'd been in the thick of treating patients and, you know, I, I wanted to know like what, what what's the story here? And interestingly, like, you know, how they got it wrong because the whole concept of patient zero. Um, the term itself is a mistaken term. Um, and the person that they blamed HIV and AIDS on, which was this um, flight attendant, this Canadian flight attendant, um, Gaetan Dugas, it was wrong. And, but, it's, but he got just lambasted for you know, his, his life and um, his choices and, and who he was. It was really, really unfair in a lot of ways. Um, so it was, it was really good to dig into that, but it was actually really difficult too, because it was really sad. And um, from a sort of um, scientific point of view, it was fascinating to see how they are able to look at a virus and do this really interesting technology where they can sort of ratchet back in time and find out when did the beginning of this virus actually happen. So just the story itself is a roller coaster ride. Yeah, it's, it reminds me also in the book of how this is insightful, but at the same time, not deceptive, but maybe a little confusing to people. You talk about uh, 
what do you say? You don't call it the popularity. You say the iconic uh, illustration of COVID. And then mm -hmm. you have that beautiful round. They even make little stuffed animals that are the COVID virus. Yeah, my son has one. <laughs> my, so my son graduated in 2020. And as a result, like his whole senior year of high school was just non-existent. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so I think, I can't remember who gave it to him, but like he, as a graduation present, he has like a COVID, like a plushie that has 2020 on it, like with the little graduation cap. Cause it's like, this is what ruined your, your year. Um, but it, you know, it's a little tongue in cheek and both sad and funny at the same time, but yeah, a lot of, yeah, that iconic picture of the, the thing is that they're uh, also beautiful, whether it's that the protein coat of the HPV particle or salmonella the cholera one, mm -hmm. they're like works of art. But the confusing part to me is using an, a scanning electron microscope and the coloring techniques. Mm -hmm. Do they, if we could imagine something that small, do they actually kind of look like that? Do they, are they actually things, spherical things with little spikes on the end? They are, that's, that is what they look like. So they, um, you know, they, they're able to molecularly show what the structure of things are. And then with scanning electron microscopes and with microscopes, you can see some of these things, you know, um, not, there's not a whole lot of um, viruses that you can see with the naked eye. I think the only one you can see with the naked eye is smallpox and it looks like a little brick um, because it's a very large virus, but most viruses you can't see under a regular microscope. Um, but under a regular microscope, yeah, you can see all, you can see bacteria, you can see parasites. Sometimes parasites, you don't need a microscope because they're so big you can just see them, um, kind of gross. But um, with scan electron microscopes, sometimes they can get these pictures of these tiny little, you know, um, these viruses and actually see structure. So um, yeah, that stuff isn't fake. I mean, the colorization and they sort of like play up sort of, you know, the shapes and things like that, but ultimately like the basic shape, it's a real thing. So um, yeah, there's a reason why they all look like that. They, they're, you know, viruses are these remarkable machines that are so good at what they do, kind of frighteningly so. So we should definitely respect them. Um, not that we should bow down to them, but we should respect them for what they do so we can understand them better. And, um, but yeah, th that, those pictures are pretty amazing. I agree. That's actually the funny, it's funny, the word respect actually came into my head when I looked at them. And then you talk, you talk, <laughs> about, you talk about the worms and I think you enjoy it, it, introducing the yuck factor. You definitely do. I do. I do. But you know what? It's, it's interesting. Like, you know, I, I'm still like a really curious person. I'm still, um, you know, that little kid that gets like sort of grossed out at the picture of like the squirmy worm and things like that. And I think there's, I think there's a lot of us have that little sort of curious inner kid that is um, kind of wants to see the gross muck. And if that honestly helps people learn about things more easily or gets children and teenagers like interested in reading and stuff like that, then so be it. I mean, we kind of did that with quackery. Quackery was officially way more humorous than, you know, patient zero reads. Um, but we purposely wanted to make history can be very dry and history can be really boring unless you're the kind of person who can really handle long, drier, boring tomes of history. We wanted to sort of liven it up and make it really entertaining so that people can learn something. And in patient zero, you know, again, we, we purposely made a decision not to make it, give it that sort of humor factor that Quackery had because it just needed this more serious tone, but we want to make it readable. So it's not going to be a dry read. It's not going to feel like you're reading a, you know, a textbook of anything. Um, there's just so much good science books out there, um, science nonfiction that's just eminently readable, like with Mary Roach and just so many other, Sam Keen. There's so many great science writers that make learning about science and science history is so fun. So we we really were trying to try and do something like that. Yeah, I interview, I've interviewed Mary four times now and <laughs> after I'm done, my mouth is re really hurts from laughing so much. She's a, a pleasure to talk to and, you know, and she really busts her ass and she gets out there and she does all kinds of research that I'm never going to do. And uh, <laughs> no, her books, I keep saying, what's the next going to be? There's gotta be something gross that you can, discuss maybe feces well i think she's already done that she's already i done think that. she's probably done that one yes i think i yeah. believe she has done that one but yeah there's like there's sort of a never-ending amount of because you know honestly um living and existing is is kind of a, a gross affair in some 
in some matters. You know, we we sanitize it up. We you know go to the bathroom behind closed doors. But you know, we're um, we're animals just like you know our puppies are. And um, there's a lot of sort of kind of gruesome things that happen in, in true life that needs to be investigated and and learned about. So yeah, I, I we don't shy away too much from the yuck factor because it's real and it's valid and it's happened. So so there it is on the page. Yeah. <laughs> talking about poop and yet you have a section in your book about fecal fecal transplants yeah and you say yes it really is true it is it is I think when I first learned about it I think we were all like in the medical field we were all like is that would that how would that work like why why would that be good because you know I think when they sort of started up we didn't even realize how important or many of us, I should say, probably people who are gastroenterologists have known this for quite some time, but I think a lot of us were also very slow to come upon the, the understanding that, you know, um, your, the, the contents of your intestines are like its own organ, this whole, you know, um, world of, of this microbiome. So the idea of a fecal transplant now makes a lot of sense. It's like you take somebody's healthy microbiome and you put it into a one that needs a lot of help that's really unbalanced, maybe with, you know, C. diff, which is this terrible infection, and it can it can fix things and it's fairly safe and relatively easy to do and um, and it's better than having your colon cut out of you because of a horrible infection. So um, yeah, I think it's good for us to sort of twist our minds around things that seem kind of awkward and awful like um at first glance but actually are really quite brilliant yeah um yeah it's funny because some of the terms you use at first might seem inapropos but then i realize like when you talk about like when you say original antigenic sin or or you say cyto cytokine storm you mm -hmm. know those words like storm and original sin don't seem to mesh, but then when you think about them, they do. Yeah. It's funny how people always create kind of internal metaphors to describe something, but lots of times they're very true. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of thoughtful, creative wording in science and almost poetic because, you know, people love this stuff and there's sometimes no better way to describe them than to um, to borrow a word from a, you know, a, a, an idea to, to make it, to make it work. So yeah, those aren't like, it's not like I came up with those words, those exist and have existed for some time. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of that, I think in, in science and history, because there's no other better way to describe them. Yeah. And the other thing that where, where people are involved for real is like when they're knights on shining armor, like Dr. Barry Marshall, and I remember reading about, when I first read about that, I said, what the hell is wrong with this guy? <laughs> and that's regarding Heliobacter pylori and ulcers. And mm -hmm. I always thought, like, like you say, everybody thought ulcers just take your Pepto-Bismol and that'll be it. So tell that story. That's a great story. So uh, I don't know how many people are aware that, um, you know, um, peptic ulcers, some peptic ulcers are associated with an actual bacteria that's in your stomach called Helicobac um, Helicobacter pylori. And um, it has been associated with stomach cancers. And um, if you can actually eradicate, like take antibiotics and cure the infection, it can help your ulcers go away. And so, but to come upon that, again, this was also a really, really novel idea in the eighties and nineties when somebody was like, yeah, I think it's actually a bacteria that's causing stomach ulcers. And people were like, no way, no way. And he actually took like the stomach contents of somebody who was infected swallowed it and gave himself this like raging case of gastritis to prove that like look I was a healthy guy and then I put this bacteria in my stomach and look what happened to me I feel awful <laughs> and um you know that's I think he did get a Nobel Prize for that I'm like oh you deserve it because I I don't know if I could do something like that but um man there's a lot of ingenuity in the years past where people really tried to figure things out um in some really remarkable ways yeah it's um yeah, he, yeah, he, like I basically, yes, he was always one of my heroes, but a big fan. Well, <laughs> yeah, you say a big fan, exactly. <laughs> oh, another one of the, one of the ones that has, um, yeah, I guess I have a lot of Latin or Greek roots, like malaria is really means bad air. Yeah, yeah, malaria means bad air, like mal is bad and aria air, 
And um, the, the belief was for a very long time was that um, malaria, which is like the symptoms of malaria are you get fevers, usually cyclical fevers. And they're like really shaking. You're like shaking and teeth are chattering, those kinds of chills and like really, really high fevers um, that it was caused by exposure to the night air, bad air or in some cases, you know, miasma, which are like these sort of like evil humors in the air um, that might cause problems um, and infections and things like that. So it was, it took a long time before they figured out that malaria was not caused by bad air, that it was actually caused by um, a parasite. And it was this little plasmodium that was inside a mosquito that would bite you and transmit this parasite. Oh, I apologize. I hope that's not dinging too much. I'm gonna that's turn right. it off. Um, there we go. And uh, it would, and so, yeah, it, it was actually, you know, an infection and it was not this. And I, I think it also, again, speaks to how for the longest time people had these other ideas of how um, infections were happened and they were not based in what we now know is germ theory. Um, it was based on humors and bad air and miasmas and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's funny because I think if you think now, in terms of like our sort of old wives tales, what your mom used to say, like if you went outside running around in the winter, but your hair was wet, they're like, you'll catch your death of a cold, you know, stuff like that. And I think some of that is just, you know, hooey. And then some of it is actually based in real science, you know, that if you suppress yourself because you're too cold, you can actually, you know, more easily get a cold, stuff like that. So I just think it's funny how there's been this like, um, change over centuries and how it still enters our sort of cultural day-to-day -day, um living um and that some of it is 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 not real and some of it is but we, we're better at figuring out what's real and not thank goodness when i was hearing those dings i was thinking like when i called you a renaissance woman i was thinking oh it's probably someone calling you to set up <laughs> If you're a concert promoter, or maybe it's a callback for a rehearsal for a Broadway show you're in, or something like that. Oh gosh, no, 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 nothing. <laughs> no nothing idea. Um, it's it's basically like my work email, just like constantly dinging me. It's like we are surrounded by like this nonstop barrage of information trying to get to us, which is, I think, yeah. also kind of funny. Just looking back on the book, I was just rereading the the um, the introduction, and I wrote something in there about how we're like constantly being barraged by like germs that are trying to kill us or eat us more <laughs> all the time. We yeah, like with, about it. with COVID, you were saying how the information, one tweet goes around the entire, and you said universe, and it's true, basically, mm -hmm. instantaneously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is universe. like, yeah, yeah it, it is like a virus and there's just so much information. There's just too much information. But yet again, you know, uh, you get to the you get to cancer and the, and here's one and that goes to your last section containment yeah. and um but cancer hasn't been contained that's why i originally i said about cancer being somewhat different like that sometimes i used to think that cancer was like part of our evolutionary process because it's kind of like a mutation like maybe there's part of it that's pushing us forward mm -hmm. that's kind of stupid, right yeah Damn. well this you know it's funny because cancer is like um you know, our cells are meant to have a shelf life. Our cells are meant to die. At some point in time, we are programmed to, to be senescent. At some point in time, we are not immortal. And, um, and when, um, when a cell loses its ability to know when to die naturally and it becomes immortal and starts to double and triple and quadruple and just um, keep growing without any sense of boundaries or borders, it, that's what a cancer is. That's what growing out of control is. And that's what happens when you get a tumor, you know, a blood cancer or something like that. Um, and so in some ways, I think it's like a little part of your body that's like, no, no, I don't want to die. I, I have, an, <laughs> I have a, a, an immortality complex here and I'm just kind of going to keep going, um, except that it takes us down as a result. It's not a very smart way of immortalizing us because it, it does it at the expense of the rest of our body. Um, and when I was researching sort of that, that chapter, I had already known for some time that, you know, there were these relationships between in infections and cancers. Um, I, I think we're all really aware of like, you know, HPV 
is this virus that causes genital warts and it is related to cervical cancer and um, throat cancers and other things like that, um, which is why we have the Gardasil, the vaccine, which can help protect against that sort of a thing. But, um, but there's a remarkable number of viruses and infections out there that can cause cancers and other health problems. And, um, and that, was a, that was interesting to research to really dig into that because I think people aren't really aware. They tend to think of like, oh, you get an infection and then you get over it and it's gone. Maybe you have some immunity to, immunity to it, but it's sort of gone. But there are some infections like HPV that they hunker down in us and they are still with us. Um, you know, we don't think of um, chicken pox as being like that big of a deal, but you know, once you get chicken pox, it goes to sleep in you and it stays in there. And that's when you're a little bit older and you're maybe really stressed out and then it wakes up and causes shingles. Like it's, it's an interesting concept to think that we are not wholly ourselves the way that we think that we are. My shingle shot was the worst, one of the worst experiences of my life. <sighs> I have to get it too. I just turned 50. So I'm like, oh man, I gotta get my shingles vaccine. <laughs> and so I'm like, I, got, I have to get my shingles vaccine and I'm trying to figure out when to do it so that it's not gonna bother me too much because the shingles vaccine is a brilliant vaccine. It's such a good one. It interestingly has, um, I like just talked about this this morning with my patients actually, because I'm always selling the shingles vaccine. Um, not actually selling, but I'm just trying to convince them to get it. But the shingles vaccine has something in it called an adjuvant, which is this little molecule that actually comes from this plant. And when it's coupled with the vaccine, it causes this really robust immune reaction. And so that's why you felt so crappy. Um, you know, your arm hurt, you probably felt maybe a little feverish, a little headachey, sore body, really tired. And that's your immune system really revving up because it's sort of like, oh, we got an invader, we need to make antibodies and, and get on top of this. Um, so that adjuvant that's in the, uh, uh, that's in the, shing the Shingrix, which is the shingles um, vaccine, um, has made the, the vaccine way more efficient and efficacious than, um, than the old, the very old, uh, shingles vaccine, which was a zoster, which is, I, I don't think, you can, I don't even think you can get that anymore, but it was, it wasn't a very good vaccine. Um, so it's funny, like some of the, some of the things that, you know, people do to try to figure out how to make these vaccines work really well, they work right, but then they, they kind of make you feel a little cruddy in the process. So I do, I do try to like, um, prepare my patients ahead of time. I'm just like, do it on a Friday. And on Saturday, when you don't feel well, you just want to watch Netflix all day or catch up on whatever you need to binge watch because you're not going to want to go out very much. And, and it's not, it doesn't happen to everybody. It's only a, a portion of people, but I like to prepare people. I'm, you're taking all the next questions and words right out of my mouth because <laughs> that's what I tell everybody. Friday, just expect not to be able to do anything. And then, mm -hmm. like you said, the receptionist at our office, she didn't feel anything. She didn't even understand what I was talking about. But yep. my brother was just out of it. And yeah, I, I thought, which would be better to get shingles or to take this vaccine? Oh, I would hate to get the shingles. You know, it's like the shingles is, it's bad enough to get the rash, which is really very kind of scary looking, but the rash is painful. It's not like you get this like unsightly thing. It hurts. And if you get it like on your face um, or on your eye or your, like it actually can cause some really, significant issues. Like you might have to go see an eye doctor because it's like an emergency. Um, it's not something that you want to get. And after the rash goes away, there's a chance that you have the pain, the pain never goes away. So you get this thing called post-herpetic neuralgia, which is when the rash is gone, but that sort of like lightningy sort of neurological pain that you get from that rash, it's with you for life. And that's what the hope is that the virus will prevent the shingles from happening, but also prevent that lifelong pain syndrome, which nobody wants to have. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely on board. I just have to find a good, I just have to find a good week to do it. I have to like, it's on my calendar. You know, it's on my to-do list. <laughs> let's see, let the patient see how long you put it off. <laughs> like my colonoscopies. Um, <laughs> but um, I did kind of lie to you because what happened was I got the first shingles vaccine and then COVID hit. Oh no. And, and yeah. then so I haven't gotten the second one because they didn't have it. They don't, it was just gone. And mm -hmm. so now, and I've waited too long. So should I get both of them again? Should I just, my doctor says, just get the second one. You'll be fine. Cause yeah, I know you're supposed to get yeah. them. With one another. 
I think I they're ta- I think that the manufacturer is telling people like even if it's been longer than a couple of months that you're supposed to wait in between that it's okay to just give the second and not start it all over again. That's yeah. my understanding, but that could change in a in in a couple of months they might say that you need to start over from scratch, but um but you know, there's another point which is, you know, science changes. Things yeah. change. You know, yeah. data doesn't change, but new data is added onto the old data and then you can interpret it differently and you can see it differently. So I think that's probably one of the things that um, is also one of the, the, the takeaways from the book, which is that I know it's really frustrating for people to be like, oh, everything with the CDC and with Fauci and everything that's going on COVID, like, you know, they, you just wake up the next day and a decision has been changed about when to do the vaccine or what to do and, you know, what's actually happening. And in the beginning, don't use masks and then use masks. And it's like, you just, you, you have to just stick to the understanding that we're doing the best that we can and we make decisions as best as we can. And, and the more time that goes by, the better able we're able to, we're, we can, you know, figure out what's going on. But Anything that's new means that the information is always going to be emerging and changing and morphing. And it doesn't mean that you need to like lose faith in science, but you have to have a better understanding of how science works and that you have to take some things with a grain of salt, but also there are times to put your foot down and put your trust there. Yeah. And going back to quackery, that reminds me specifically of the one press conference when Trump was especially his hand gestures and that woman who imitates Trump. She did such a good job with that one where he wanted you to you know, drink Lysol or inject it. <laughs> yeah, she went viral. It. That was funny. <laughs> yeah, viral. That was a good pun. Oh, um, God, yeah. yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, yeah, but my favorite part of that, again, kind of like your son having the plush toy, was watching Dr. Burks in the background with her lovely scarf. Man, she had some beautiful scarves. but. But, but you could tell, I, and you know, I do respect her to a certain extent, but she should have at that moment, she should have gotten up and said, Hey, I, that's it. I can't, you could see her squirming. You could see her expression, but that would be, and that's a good knight on shining armor, Dr. Warren kind of thing. When do you make a stand? God, I mean, honestly, that's, I can't speak to what I would do in her situation because if she got up there and said something, she probably would have been booted and fired. Um, which means that if she knew that she had an opportunity to try to still help the general public and save lives, and she was like, if I bite my tongue, I can still do my job. But if I say something, I will have made my stand, but then I'll lose my job. And what if the next person comes in and is actually going to do more harm? It's, it's, a, it's really complicated. That was a very, I, I can't imagine what it was like to work during that administration. I'm sure it was just, I'm sure they were all getting shingles. Honestly, they were probably so stressed out. They were probably, I bet like behind like the closed doors of the White House, there's just shingles outbreaks all over the place because everybody's freaking out and so stressed. But um, no, I, I can't speak to what I would do in that situation. That is really, really hard. You know, talking about the pain of shingles, one of the other things you do really well is you describe to people who just know these things like yellow fever or diphtheria or mad cow disease or we're going to other one or even like shingles, is how much, how gruesome they are. Well, we haven't talked about the, the 1918 flu epidemic, but you know, mm-hmm. how horrible it is to die. And the only thing you say that's good about it is that these really bad ones kill you really quickly. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, the, the 1918 influenza pandemic was so remarkable and shocking. I, and I think there's a lot of people, it, it took this pandemic, I think, to refresh people's memory of how bad it was because people were like, oh, was it, has it ever been so bad? Or what, what was that like? Did that, you know, I think people forgot. And I, I, I actually wrote about it in one of my books in um, A Beautiful Poison. It takes place during 1918 and the pandemic actually hits New York City while the book is happening. And so you get to sort of see um, the fear and the how swiftly it kills it kills um, younger people, um, but I I'd kind of known about that since I was a kid because I would see it in a couple books and I remembered it. But I feel like there's also you know some up and coming generations that have forgotten or just don't have access to um, it in culture in the way that they remember that it happened. So I it was I think a really good um, sort of journey back in time to look at how bad it was. And unfortunately, I think this pandemic did remind people like, yeah, that happened and it was terrible. And I don't think you guys realize 
how horrific the seasonal flu was because it was it was an absolute killer it was really 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 dangerous and um just this idea that you know you could get it and then within 24 hours you're blue in the face and 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 dying is incomprehensible to most people when they think of like a normal flu season but that it happened yeah and like some of your older illustrations like that woman before and after mm -hmm. really kind of hits home yeah yeah but Yes. Oh, and I know you, you have to get going because you got things to do. But the one thing I, because I have the bookstore and, you know, I have to wait uh, a little bit to put the, put it on the table unless I cheat. And I always think I'm going to go to jail because I get the box and it says, do not open until <laughs> like on the mattresses where it says, you know, do not remove under penalty of law. Yeah, that's right. You must get, you must get that a lot. Every book that comes in, it comes in right before the actual release date. So you're probably like, should I rip it open? Should I? <laughs> I, no, you don't know me, but yeah, I definitely open them. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, it's you the know, perks, of, they, perks of being gonna, a bookseller, right? <laughs> what are they going to do to me? Um, <laughs> but the thing is now it'll be on the front table and in the window, and then I want to get your back stock. But the problem, the dilemma I have is, okay, do I put it all together or do I move you from genre to genre to genre? <laughs> I move you to the poetry section do i move you to young adult where do i put all your stuff yeah i don't know probably you could probably mix and match it change it around every day see what works <laughs> who knows but um but uh yeah i mean um it's it's it is really fun to write about all these different things i think it's a really good mental exercise for me but i have had a lot of joy in writing about you know this nonfiction. Um, material and I've had a lot of joy writing the fiction but immersing myself kind of it's the same kind of research honestly the stuff that happens with patient zero the, the stuff that I have to read about they're human stories ultimately you know and that's what I think I find the most interesting is this melding of of science and humanity um, and that's where those really difficult gray zones happen and you know we tackled that I think in this book but I I like to I like to write about it in the fiction because it's it's difficult. It's sticky and difficult, you know, and I like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, hold. Oh, before we go, hold up the cover again, because. Oh, yeah, this is the cover. This is actually an advanced copy, so it's not the inside is all. I yeah, know, I have it all earmarked and everything, but it's all black and white. But these are color photos on the insides. There's lots of different illustrations and things, as you can kind of see. And um, and this is what the cover looks like. Yeah, it's, it's a great so, cover. I, yeah. I, I, they did such a great um, thing with the cover and in the actual, the real thing on the back, there's like this little circle with this woman who's coughing and she's spewing particles <laughs> out of her cough. And you can see the little lines emanating and then they end up hitting like all these different things on the front cover, which is super brilliant. Our cover, our cover artist and our art department is just amazing. So it's a big thank you to everybody at Workman that did such a great job on this book. Yeah, I always ask people about the cover because, and I say this every single time, people say you can't judge a book by its cover, but every, without exception, every single person who comes into my store does exactly that, which is why publishers do the covers because they want to sell books. Yes, I know, I know. It's a tricky situation, but I get it, I get it. In this case, I think they knocked it out of the park. They did a really uh, great job. Yeah, it's definitely a good cover. Well, anyway, so go do the things you have to do. <laughs> I will, and, thank uh, you. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. I really, I really love the book, and I'm gonna go delve into your back stock because I didn't know about it. I knew about Quackery, but I didn't know about the other ones, and now I want to look at those too. You're welcome, and I'm always happy to talk about them. And I had such a great time talking to you. So thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you.